The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. Talk Station, Faith Matters. Well, good Sunday morning to you, and welcome to Faith Matters on the Talk Station. My name is Carl Zorowski. I am the pastor at St. Peter's United Methodist Church in Moorhead City, and I'm joined this morning by my good friend and my clergy brother, Jim Daub, from St. Paul Lutheran Church in Havelock. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. I'm wondering, do you have anything special coming up at St. Paul? One of the things we have going on is we are a collection site uh, on behalf of the Coastal Women's Shelter for their big school supply drive. So if anyone is out uh, shopping and would like to pick up any extra school supplies, you can bring them to St. Paul Lutheran Church 305 U.S. Highway 70 West. Our office hours are Monday through Friday, 830 to 1230. And feel free to bring them in. We have a big box and we'll be happy to, to collect those to deliver them up to the Coastal Women's Shelter Well, that's wonderful. I want to share with our listeners that St. Peter's is holding our annual Vacation Bible School this week. It's beginning tomorrow evening. It's going to be from 5.30 to 8, Monday through Friday of this week. Uh, And we will be providing supper for the children each night. Our theme this year is called Ready, Set, Move. Follow Jesus here, there, and everywhere. But it's going to be a week of fun. It's going to be a week uh, where the children can make new friends and learn all about Jesus. This VBS is for children age four through those finishing the sixth grade. And you can find more information on our church website, St. Peter's UMC. Dot com. Now, Jim, you've got our first article we're going to look at this morning has to do with uh, the communist Chinese government. Yes, and, and actually, if you are a, a loyal listener, and we hope you are, you'll remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about the, the PETA organization rewriting the Bible. And so now here is a, a lot more serious aspect of the flip side of the coin. And this comes from Fox News, and it is an opinion piece written by Representative Mike Gallagher. And it is entitled, The Chinese Communist Party is Rewriting the Bible. And Representative Gallagher says, as part of a punish to sinicize religion, the Chinese Communist Party has embarked on a 10-year project to rewrite the Bible and other religious texts. In the Gospel of John, Jesus famously confronts the accusers of a woman caught committing adultery, saying, quote, let the one among you who is guiltless be the first to throw a stone at her, end quote. Jason accusers slink away, and Jesus says to the woman, quote, Has no one condemned you? Not one, sir, she replied. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go away, and from this moment sin no more. Now this is a beautiful story of forgiveness and mercy, unless you're a CCP official. Then it's a story of a dissident challenging the authority of the state. A possible sneak preview of what the Bible with a socialist characteristics might look like as it appears in a Chinese university textbook in 2020. The written Gospel of John expert ends not with mercy, but with Jesus himself stoning the adulterous woman to death. Now across Henan province, local CCP officials forced Protestant churches to replace the Ten Commandments with Xi Jinping quotes, Thou shall have no other gods before me, became discounts like resolutely guard against the infiltration of Western ideology. Now, the 10-year project to rewrite the Bible, Koran, and other sacred texts is all part of Xi Jinping's quest to make the faithful serve the party rather than God. At the 19th Party Congress, Chairman Xi declared, quote, We will insist on the sinicization of Chinese religions 
and provide active guidance for religion and socialism to coexist. So let me translate, says Representative Gallagher. Xi Jinping has no problem with the first commandment just so long as he and the CCP are playing the role of God. You might expect the Vatican, the leaders of the largest Christian congregation in the world, to be incensed and defiant. Unfortunately, you would be wrong. In a secret 2018 negotiation, the Vatican agreed to allow the CCP to select Catholic bishops in China, supposedly in exchange for vague reassurance of, quote, safety, end quote, for some Catholic congregations, which were immediately abrogated. The CCP wants the authority to select the next Dalai Lama, a sacred tradition in Tibetan Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhists are attempting to stand up to CCP coercion, but Beijing counters that even Pope Francis, leader of the mighty Catholic Church, accepts their authority over Christian leadership. Religion's power is tantalizing to the CCP. What better demonstration of party supremacy than bringing global religions to the heel? And it goes on after that of how the, the, Catholic, of how the CCP is continuing to, to want to change the Bible so that they become God. Right, and it's not just the Bible that they're after. They're after other sacred texts as well. They want to do whatever they can to um, basically shut down any um, religious practices any religious teaching, and replace all of that with um, basically the worship of the communist government, the party leaders in China. Yeah. And, um, Jim, you mentioned that we had talked about the PETA rewrite of Genesis um, the other week. And, you know, that was kind of ludicrous, uh, where they were talking about Adam and Eve wearing hemp and bamboo instead of animal skins, and Abraham and Sarah adopted a dog from the shelter. And that all sounded, you know, it sounded nice and friendly, and, and it was um, certainly pushing an agenda that PETA has, where they want people to be more in tune with being kind to animals, being kind to the earth, all this kind of stuff. But nobody's going to take that very seriously. Here, what they're doing in China is not just pushing an agenda. They are trying to control people. PETA is, is happy to tell people, you should think like this way. Communist China is saying, you had better think like this, because if you don't, we will crush you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and more than you had better, you will. You will, right. They're, it's the Chinese Communist Party in this rewrite of the Bible is not just pushing an agenda. They are suppressing truth. They're suppressing the Word of God. They're creating a religion of government. It's not about influencing people. It is about controlling people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's very scary, if you think about it, that one person's, uh, that they have decided that this is what is going to be, and they will be now the center. We see how that is in history, how that has not played out very well for some of the world leaders who have tried to be the dictators and the gods for the people. But in the article, one of the things that, that, uh, that the representative pointed out, and I think this is a, a, an amazing thing for, for us to hear as well, uh, representative says, yet even under intense persecution, faith persists throughout China and the number of faithful grows. In my work in Congress, I've heard unthinkable stories of religious oppression, but I've also listened to accounts of underground churches, brave clergy, and steadfast believers every bit as courageous as saints of the early church. So I guess we can always say is, even though you may try to push God off his throne, it will never work, and the faithful will still become more faithful, and the believers will still believe, and Jesus will still be king. And what comfort that is to, to hear that no matter what may be going on, we still have the, the great joy of knowing that God is still the center. And, and how, what great, um, how fleeting it is for man to try to think that he can be more important than the Lord. 
um, the, the writer of this uh, piece goes on to say, the CCP wishes for there to be nothing higher than their authority. And that's, that is a vision of, of making yourself God. You are the yeah. highest authority. And uh, the CCP views a love for anything besides their Marxist-Leninist regime with vicious jealousy. He says in an interview with The Guardian, the pastor of one Chinese church stated, quote, in this war, in Xinjiang, in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Chengdu, the rulers have chosen an enemy that can never be imprisoned. That is the soul of man. The pastor ended with an assessment that we must make come true. The PRC rulers are doomed to lose. As you said, God is not going to be um, shut down. Jesus is not going to be knocked off the throne no matter what the Chinese government does. Exactly. The Lord is the beginning. He is the end. And we, we hear a lot of talk in this country about people being canceled. Well, that's what we're seeing here in this communist government. They are canceling Christianity. They're saying, we don't even want you to hear what this word has to say. We don't want you to know this truth. I think they're afraid of that truth. Absolutely. Well, we thank you for joining us for this first segment of Faith Matters Today. We'll be back right after these messages. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station 1071. I am Pastor Jim Daub from St. Paul Lutheran Church in Havelock, and I'm here with uh, Pastor Carl Zarowski with St. Peter United Methodist Church in Moorhead City. We continue with another article that we will be presenting to you from the religiousnews.com. Pastor. All right, this article is written by Joshua Stanton and Benjamin Spratt. It's entitled, Bringing Light Without God, Humanist Chaplain Anthony Cruz Pantoyas. The article says, Candles are integral to many traditions, from Catholic Mass to Jewish Shabbat celebrations to Buddhist meditation. At Tufts University, candles are also an uncommon tool of religious pluralism. The humanist community at Tufts, a student-led community of atheists, agnostics, and others who are, quote, striving for meaning without boundaries, unquote, as its mission statement states, has sponsored candle-making events where other faith and philosophical groups gather with HCAT members to build community amidst the campus's religious diversity. It has become a signature of our community, said Anthony Cruz Pantoyas, 30, the humanist chaplain at the school. The candles, he said, affirm the humanist compassion for their religious counterparts. Perhaps more surprising still is that humanists put their candles to use in their own rituals, conducted most Thursday evenings and led by a member of the group, which varies according to the exam schedule, but hovers around 20 students. The act of meeting itself is part of the ritual aspect of the humanist's communal spirit. They said, we prepare, set up the space together, have the activity or conversation, eat together, and then clean up together. We build community insofar as we care for our space together, making it special by gathering and also by the regard we show for it and for each other. And that's according to Pantoyas. And just as making candles unites the students in performing a service for the Tufts community, lighting a few of the candles has become a recurrent part of the evening. Creating ritual in community, even if it does not center on God, said Pantoyas, elevates the group's time and experience together. Humanism is particularly gaining ground on college campuses as students ask big questions, explore non-belief, and seek deep friendships. The number of paid humanist chaplains on campus 
remains in the single digits nationally, and it was not long ago that the news that Harvard University had appointed a humanist as its chief chaplain raised eyebrows. Pantoius recognizes that HCAT, which is the humanist community at Tufts, is primed to have a larger place on campus and is prepared to support the student population that identifies as agnostic, atheist, free-thinking, questioning, and humanist with outreach and expanding program. This fall, they will teach a course titled The Practice of Being Human, Humanism for Everyday Life. Um, Jim, when I when I see this article, uh, you know the fact that Religion News Services is talking about this makes me think. Well, this must be something that's happening in quite a few places to to catch someone's attention enough to bring this to the national limelight. But then they talk about the fact that the number of humanist chaplains across the country at campuses ranges in the single digits. That's yeah. like maybe nine, maybe less. Exactly. And and also what what kind of was first of all I I'd never heard of what a humanistic chaplain was. I didn't know there was such a thing. Me neither. And I've I've been a pastor for over 24 years. And so that one was a new one for me. So that did a little bit of research on there. But I I I guess the thing that was kind of interesting for me is what do we define church as? Church mm-hmm. is a gathering of people, a fellowship of people. Uh, think about the early church. The early church was the breaking of bread, mm-hmm. the fellowship, and the apostles' teachings. Mm-hmm. And so, the sharing of life with one another, where where everybody had everything in common. That is not that they all thought the same. What it meant was they all, whatever whatever was mine was ours. Yeah, yeah, they took exactly. care of each other. They provided for one another. Right. It was a community. Community. Mm-hmm. And and what is described here as uh, what Pantoius is, is doing, they gather together, they fellowship, they eat, mm-hmm. they take care of each other, mm-hmm. and they have a craft of making candles. Mm-hmm. That, that kind of sounds like church without it being church. They have a belief— and and things and 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 I'm not trying or, to make light or a uh, lack of belief or a lack of belief. Yeah, mm-hmm. I- exactly. And I I think it's it's interesting. Is I I think uh, Pastor Blake a couple weeks ago had had said in in our conversations to each other is and and I totally agree. We really don't ever see a true atheist because even yourself has becomes God, and there's always something that becomes God. Um, whether it be money, whether it be career, whether it be trying to, um, you know, be be the best that you can be or, or whatever, you, there's never anything that we ever become devoid of to say that we are constantly without anything. And, and so I think, you know, there's there's so many opportunities to to try to uh, to to influence and and you look at and and our our youth our our college age students asking the hard questions absolutely and and they're trying to find meaning and and deeper meaning and deeper relationships but but yet i think it's just very interesting to see how well what what i should say what i found very interesting is of all the things to draw people together was candle making Mm-hmm. You know, but yet how symbolic it was in the sense that it was shining light into their own darkness. Mm-hmm. But yet what does what does for us who are in the church, what do we say? Jesus is the light of the world, the light that no darkness can ever overcome. Mm-hmm. And and I think just again the juxtaposition between the the darkness of sin, the light that we find in Christ. And and here folks who are trying so hard to find light, so hard to find meaning, so hard to find answers are are looking in all the wrong places with light that is man-made that wears out and and doesn't continue. Mm-hmm. And I think that becomes a, a struggle sometimes. Well, throughout um, 
across all different kinds of cultures, light has always seemed to be this symbol of understanding, mm -hmm. a symbol of wisdom, um, intellectual thought. Light is the opposite of ignorance. It's the opposite of darkness. Almost universally, darkness is considered evil, scary, bad. Um, and, and light is this symbol of hope, this symbol of life, this symbol of um, something, something better. And look at the, uh, like even the ancient um, Hebrew creation story. What's the first thing that God does? He says, let there be light. Yeah. And then when Jesus comes into the world, like you said, he is the light that has come into the world. And so I find it interesting that this group that says, well, we don't really want to believe in God or any kind of a higher power, but we've got to have that light. We've got yeah. to have that symbolism of light. Yeah. And in the... Uh, uh, in the Christian tradition, um, I, I, I don't know how it is in the Lutheran church. I know in our church, we have two candles that sit up on the altar or the communion table. And one of them represents the divinity of Christ. The other is the humanity of Christ. At the beginning of the service, we actually have the light is brought in. Um, and the two candles are lit to represent the presence of God during our service. At the end of the service, um, the, the acolyte who carries the light in then takes a candle lighter, lights it, snuffs out the two candles, but the flame is still burning. And we carry it out of the sanctuary where we carry the light of Christ out into the world. So it's, there's more symbolism there than just a candle. Exactly, but but I have to wonder what is it that they're getting out of a candle in yeah. this humanist community? Well, and and there's also that that idea of that we're creating the light, you know, the creation of the candle and the creation of, of things. But but again, I for your answer the question answer your question was it like in the Lutheran church? We do the same. We mm -hmm. we have the the candles on the altar. We and, did it first. Well, yeah. <laughs> actually, I don't think we did. I no, fifteen hundreds for us. You okay. know, that's okay. still I'll, new. I'll we'll, give you that one. We give our our Catholic friends the they had the candles first, so you know. But but yeah, we you look at that and you you see is 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 that again that if we root everything in ourselves and in our creation and our making it. I, we're we're making it on a, a very shifty sand foundation uh, mm -hmm. with that, but um, but again, I think the more important part, and and even in the Christian church, no Christian church is perfect. No Christian church is is without fault. But there's fellowship, and and our hope is that you you all who are listening, if you're not on your way to church, hopefully you will be able to find a church that you can find fellowship, find the light of of Christ, and the light that that brings you hope and joy in those dark moments of of your your life as we continue each day. And Jim, you keep you keep saying you know the the light of Christ, and that's what that's what sets. The Christian church apart from this um, humanist community. Humanist community, they have the fellowship, they have the good works, they're going out, they're feeding people, they're helping people, they're giving everyone a sense of belonging. That's what the church offers, but we offer it centered on Christ, and that's, that's the difference. Exactly. We'll be back right after these messages. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station. I am Carl Zabrowski, the pastor at St. Peter's United Methodist Church. And with me this morning is my good friend Jim Dowd from St. Paul Lutheran Church in Havelock. And Jim, you've got an article now from the stream. Yes, and this is written by J. Stone Street and G. Sunshine entitled, How Two SCOTUS Supreme Court of the United States Dissents Reveal Worldview. And they say, in 303 Creative v. Ellenis, the Supreme Court upheld Lori Smith's free speech rights, deciding that the state of Colorado could not force her to produce websites for so-called same-sex weddings. 
Ever since, media pundits and public officials have distorted the ruling, claiming that it will allow people to refuse service to LGBT individuals. However, even the state of Colorado acknowledged that Smith serves all people with her business, but she would not provide services that meant expressing a view that violates her faith. The state made clear its intent was to suppress Smith's idea about marriage. By a vote of 6 to 3, the Supreme Court found this a clear violation of the First Amendment guarantee of freedom of expression. The dissent in this case was written by Justice Sonia Sotomayor, joined by Justices Elena Kagan and Kinjati Brown-Jackson. It featured a rambling history of civil rights and public accommodation law, law that prevents discrimination of the public in services. Sotomayor argued that the, dissension, that the decision violated the trajectory of the expansion of civil rights to more and more marginalized groups in society. She claimed that creating a website was a matter of providing a service and had nothing to do with expression, implausibility, implausibly arguing that creating a website for a so-called same-sex wedding would not compel Smith's speech. Writing for the majority, Justice Gorsuch dismantled the dissent, noting that the history of public accommodations and civil rights had no bearing on the matter, and that Sonisayor's argument that the question involved service rather than expression was contradicted by both the state of Colorado and the Tenth Circuit Court. He also noted how the dissent contradicted itself. Still, the problems with Sonia Sotomayor's dissent extend beyond the issues identified by Gorsuch. When Sotomayor appealed to the murder of Matthew Shepard and the mass shooting in Orlando's Pulse nightclub as examples of the dangers LGBT people face in the country, she was appealing to a revisionist history. The motive for Matthew Shepard's murder is at best unsettled and likely had nothing to do with his sexual orientation. The shooter at the Pulse nightclub had pledged allegiance to ISIS and apparently targeted Pulse because of its lax security. While Sotomayor may simply have been sloppy, relying on popular rhetoric without investigating further, it is more likely that these are examples of her worldview commitment. Specifically, she employed standpoint standpoint uh, the idea that truth is ultimately unknowable so that we can only rely on identity markers like race, ethnicity, gender identity, and sexual orientation to determine what is right or wrong. In standpoint, in, in standpoint epistemology, minorities have greater insights about the world because they know how to operate both in their own setting and in their dominant culture. This is the reason behind Soda Samoyer's inf infamous statement given at the University of California, Berkeley, before her nomination. She states, quote, I would hope that a wise Latina woman with the richness of her experiences would more often than not reach a better conclusion than a white male who hasn't lived that life. However, Though Soda Samoyer may assume her, her lived experience offers a fuller view of reality, her perception became more authoritative to her than the facts of reality. Rather than committing to an objectivity, she can determine via cultural narratives of oppression what happened regarding Shepard's murder or the Pulse shooting or the conflict between Lori Smith and the state of Colorado. Even worse, the objective facts, at least those that counter the accepted narratives, in these cases can be ignored, neglected, or revised. And the article goes on and it talks more about how the idea is that in, in many of these aspects, feelings and opinions seem to trump the law. Now, Carl, do you think that becomes a little bit of a problem for the highest court in the land? I think it becomes a very great problem for the highest court in the land that uh, that problem is then going to um, trickle down to all the other courts because if the Supreme Court makes a decision that's based on experience or feeling, they are setting a precedent that then any lower court can say, well, in the case of X versus Y, on this date, the Supreme Court ruled this way. And there are going to be times 
where a decision is made by a court that I disagree with. But if the court can show me this is what the law says and this is how the law applies here, um, if, if it is in fact um, explaining the law and it's following and it's correct according to the letter of the law, I have to accept that. And if I am a judge, especially a Supreme Court justice, my job is not to come up with the decision that makes me feel good about myself or the decision that I prefer, but what is the decision that the law says must be reached? Yeah. Notice uh, Justice uh, um, Sotomayor said uh, at uh, a speech in Berkeley, to judge is an exercise of power. That's frightening. Yeah. And, and whether or not you're a conservative justice, a moderate justice, a liberal justice, I, it does make a difference. Right. But the fact to, to even have publicly stated to, to judge is an exercise of power is really, a, in my opinion, a dangerous aspect. Yes, a judge does have great power as they sit on the bench. And, you know, for us in the church, we say that that power is 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 a divinely given power from from God to do his his duty here on on the earth. But nonetheless, that almost makes it sound like, well, I will use my power how I want to use my power for my way, not the best way. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. And and it's to me also it's it's also in as we think about the the decisions that have to make. Uh, I remember a, a couple weeks ago when there was the decision by the court regarding um, the oh the name just slipped affirmative uh, action the, the affirmative action and and some people didn't like that so all the memes came across Facebook that this is a kangaroo court but then. Uh, Two days, three days later, the court made a unanimous decision regarding religious freedom. And that one surprised the Dickens out of me that all of the justices fell on the side of freedom. And amazingly, now that you could practice whatever religion you wanted, pastafarianism or whatever, um, you then could be, that was no problem. It was no longer a, a, a kangaroo court. It was now a wonderful court. And that just, it, I, I guess maybe our, our people are, are, are too fickle in, in the U.S. Well, but you, you commented on her um, statement that she made in a speech delivered at Berkeley where she said to judge is an exercise of power. She also said that not only is it an exercise of power, it is not a matter of interpreting law. Yeah. I thought that's what a judge did. I thought that's what the Supreme Court did. They look at the law and they say, this is what the law says. This is what it means. And this is the decision that's made based on what the law says. And sometimes there are laws that aren't good laws. But if those are the laws that are in place, those are the laws that we live by. Yeah. I thought that was the whole point of the the woman holding the scales with a blindfold over her eyes, Lady Justice. But is, is she maybe peeking? I don't I don't remember if she is I, or is not. She, I don't know. Maybe. Well, I, th- these days I think she's got her eyes covered because she just doesn't want to see what's going on around her. Well, there could be great truth to that. But I think I think you're right. the The idea of the the highest court in the land is to judge the law, and and I think we've seen the the justices over the years that they have made decisions that perhaps were not how the people thought they would have decided based on some of the confirmation hearings or things like that, but they decided based on the law. But if we start having the highest court in the land begin to judge on feelings or their feelings or their viewpoint or worldview and not on the law that is there, we begin a very slippery slope that we grease very quickly. And I think that is a very dangerous um, and non-God-pleasing thing. Over the last 20 years or so, there has been so much discussion when 
say a presidential election comes around. People start talking about the ages of the people on the Supreme Court. Well, we need to get a Republican in so we can get Republican judges. We need to elect a Democrat so we can get Democratic judges. Oh, my word, we have too many Republican judges. Let's expand the Supreme Court mm -hmm. to get more judges so that we can get more Democrats or more Republicans or whatever. I think that in... In a, in a best case scenario, the Supreme Court, it shouldn't matter whether no. you are a Republican or a Democrat or a conservative or a liberal. You need to be somebody who understands case law, can look at the law and say, I don't like this law, but this is what it says. And this is the only logical uh, conclusion to this case. Exactly. And our law for you is don't go anywhere. We have one more, one more article coming up on Faith Matters, the talk station 107.1. And you don't want to miss this one because this one is just going to knock your socks off. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the talk station. I am Pastor Jim Dowd from St. Paul Lutheran Church, and I'm with Pastor Carl Zorowski from St. Peter's United Methodist Church, and this is now the sign of the apocalypse. We have the wonderful, wonderful article that Pastor will be reading for us. It is such a sparkly day. This is this is something. This this is that's a word for me. it. And and yeah, we'll just we'll just go with this. This comes from the stream. It's called No Sparkle in This Darkness, and it's written by Tom Gilson. Last month in Adena, Minnesota, a congregation of churchgoers recited a creed to affirm their solemn, heartfelt belief in sparkly, bright, rainbow love and a God who pretty much worships them. No one died, and no one even fainted from embarrassment. Health professionals are investigating to discover why not. They should have anyway. Others have written about this creed. I'm more interested in the people who spoke it. What on earth were they thinking? You may have seen the video. A Lutheran pastor, and, and Jim wanted to make sure everybody understood this is not all the Lutherans. This is not all the Lutherans. This one particular Lutheran church, a Lutheran pastor, leads her congregation in a bubblegum belief statement called the Sparkle Creed. One website described it as, quote, a version of the Apostles' Creed modified to include the LGBTQ plus community, unquote. No, not even close. Sure, it rips off language from the Apostles' Creed, but otherwise it's a trite little feel-good chant meant to make today's progressives feel weepy and gooey over the love they all feel for each other. The Creed's author, Rev. Rachel Small Stokes, posted it on Twitter early in 2021 and received comments like, Oh, I adore this, or love this, with a whole little string of rainbow heart emojis afterward. I'm going to share now this Sparkle Creed with you. Uh, listeners, but do understand that what I'm about to say does not reflect the beliefs or the opinions or anything of any of the three of us in this room or the talk station. But here is the Sparkle Creed. See if I can do this with a straight face, Jim. Try it. Try it. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads and saw everyone as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the AIDS quilt whose feet are grounded in mud and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. I believe in the call to each of us that love is love is love, so beloved, let us love. I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Amen. You did better than what I would have done. Well done. 
Tom Gilson goes on to say, it almost seems wrong to use the word creed for such blasphemy, but it's a statement of religious belief. So even though it's utterly wrong, it still counts. The word creed, by the way, comes from the Latin for I believe. Um, first of all, let's talk about what a creed is. A creed is a statement in which um, a group professes their doctrinal faith. They say, these are our standards. This is the bedrock of our faith. These are the things that we believe. Uh, there was a creed written in uh, 325 at the 325 AD, the first council of Nicaea, uh, called the Nicene Creed. And that's the defining statement of belief for mainstream Christianity and in those um, Christian denominations that adhere to it. Some of our listeners um, may not be familiar with the Nicene Creed. You may be familiar with the Apostles' Creed, which is I don't want to um, diminish it at all, but it's almost like a Reader's Digest version of the Nicene Creed. But it includes all the tenets of faith that we say these are non-negotiable. God is the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Son uh, came into the world through a virgin birth. The Son died for our sins. The Son rose from the dead. The Son will return to judge the living and the dead. And we believe in the gathering of people together as the church. We believe in forgiveness of sin. We believe in, and it just says these are the things that we believe. As Lutherans, you guys differ a little bit from us in some of the trappings of church and some of the ritual and the prayers we use, but those tenets of faith, the things in the creed, you and I are on the same page there. Absolutely. Well, and I think one of the things, and, and you know, Carl, you mentioned that, is this is, there's, as you have said before, there are different kind of flavors of Methodism, if you will, and there are different flavors of Lutheranism. I'm a Missouri Synod Lutheran, and, and we do not have the Sparkle Creed in our church. We don't. We don't. We, either. We're not going to. We will never, ever have the Sparkle Creed there. But what we do have is we do have the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. Every once in a while, we pull out what's called the Athanasian Creed, which is the ginormous creed in there. But the whole point is I tell people, what is the, the, the Apostles' Creed? The Apostles' Creed is the greatest witnessing tool that we have available for us as Christians. Because if someone says, well, what do you believe as a Christian? You can recite the Apostles' Creed. And, and that tells what we believe. The, someone once told me, there's no creed but Jesus here at my church. And, and I said, okay, well, if you had the Sparkle Creed at your church and you had no creed but Jesus, well, what you just confessed in the Sparkle Creed is not even biblical. You confessed in a per person that did not even acknowledge the divinity, let alone the humanity, and in you you had confessed a, a whole belief system that was not even in in line with what God's word teaches. So if you say no creed but Jesus, then this creed is completely leading people astray. And I think there's great danger. You know, the, the creeds are from, you know, the the 6th, 7th, and, and earlier centuries, and, and it teaches. Now, someone says, well, the Apostles' Creed is not in the Bible, so why should we believe it? Well, it's the collection of teachings from Scripture. You mm -hmm. can go through each of the lines in in the, the Apostles' Creed and, and have that marked out of from which which chapters of Bible is that in there. And, and you look at, at least, you know, the Lutheranism, um, the kind of as they broke away from, from Catholicism, is why did you confess the creeds? Apostles' Creed was always used as your baptism. You confess the Apostles' Creed as part of your bap right before baptism. And then the Nicene Creed was always confessed as part of the communion liturgy because you were all together as one in there. And, and so I think there's rich beauty in 
the confession of the creeds because that's what ties the churches together, that it's not just a, a bunch of people doing a bunch of things because it makes us feel good and leading us away from what the Lord, what the Lord teaches in his word. It, it's rooted in God's word. Mm-hmm. The Sparkle Creed is not. You know, he wore two tunics. Okay, that might be talking about his... It's not two. It was one, and it was fabulous. Oh, a fabulous tunic. That's right. He had two dads. He had two two dads. dads. Okay, well, yeah, you know, Joseph was like the surrogate father, I guess you could say, you know, but, you know, and the refraction of light and all, you know, I I don't know. I just think it's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And, And one of the things that is very dangerous here is they, in this creed, they're making God into who they need him to be. Yes. They're making God and Jesus into somebody who conveniently fits into their worldview and does not, does not convict them in any manner. When I talk about the Apostles' Creed, when I, when I recite that, we recite that each week at our church, except when we do the Nicene Creed. But in that creed, we state that Jesus is going to judge the yeah. living and the dead. We confess that Jesus um, forgives sins. We confess that. This, there's no mention of sin whatsoever. And yeah. I think it's wonderful for us to preach and teach about mercy and grace and love and forgiveness. But sin is part of that equation. Yeah. Because why did Jesus come into the world to save sinners? He didn't come into the world to sparkle and yeah. to, to tell us all that we're wonderful people and to bring us all together as a family. Yeah, he did come to bring us all together as a family, but there's that sin problem. And so he did more than wear a fabulous tunic. He was stripped of his robe. He was beaten. He died for our sins so that we could be with God. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's just critical. So... Um, I hope folks um, listen to what's taught in your church. Is what you're hearing, does it line up with what the Word of God says? If not, then maybe you need to question what you're hearing. But if you go to church today and you hear the Sparkle Creed, don't go back to that church. But we hope you will come back next week for another edition of Faith Matters. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. To revisit today's program or to find more episodes, visit thetalkstation.com. is a production of the talk station.